what if we've been picturing things all wrong? Or maybe, what if we've been picturing them wrong enough that we don't realize how off track we are until at some point the math doesn't add up? I, I think often about what happened in the 16th century when uh, the early astronomer Copernicus did some math and proposed, based on his calculations, watching the planets, watching the sun, that it wasn't the Earth at the center of the solar system after all, as people had assumed for centuries, but rather what made the most sense, what fit the math right, the mental picture to have was that the sun was at the center of the solar system and the Earth went around the sun with all the other planets all going around the sun. It was revolutionary. They sometimes even call it the Copernican revolution. The idea that our mental picture of how things work needed to shift. And for a long, long time, people had just assumed we are the center of everything. And when somebody comes along and says, hold on, let me offer to you a new image. It makes more sense of the data that's actually around. It was scandalous. And for that matter, a bunch of church folks, both in the Roman Catholic and budding Protestant movements as well, thought it was nonsense to suggest the earth went around the sun. Not one of our finer moments when it comes to us respectable religious folk. But with the hindsight of maybe five centuries, it's worth recognizing sometimes our mental picture of how things work needs to shift and to change. And once it does, all of a sudden, things make a whole lot more sense to us than maybe they did before. The data that never quite fit that we kind of had to pretend wasn't there all of a sudden makes sense. Sense. Well, I want to propose that 2,000 years ago, Jesus does the same thing, not about the astronomical um, arrangement of the solar system, but about what we sometimes call the reign of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew sometimes translates it. The thing is, as Jesus comes on the scene, in obviously what we call the first century, lots of folks had the image in mind of what it will look like when God's kingdom finally comes. That kind of language the prophets had been using, the imagery of God as king, and when God's kingdom finally comes, when the day of the Lord comes, and when God finally restores the kingdom to our people, they all had sort of assumptions. You know it would look like, well, you know, the other kind of kingdoms we've seen in the world. One empire after another, after all, had conquered the land that ancient Israel had called its own. They had seen the Romans do the kingdom thing, the Greeks do it before them, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and a host of others along the way. They pictured kingdoms, as you know, an official national government or an empire that marches in its soldiers and you know whose kingdom you're in because it has power and its soldiers are the ones calling the shots running through the streets. Its banners are the ones that are unfurled all around the city and all around the country. They have the power. You know whose kingdom you are in because they're the ones conquering, they're the ones taxing, they're the ones sort of announcing their presence. And then Jesus comes along and like Copernicus shifting everybody Everybody's picture says maybe the reign of God looks different. Maybe it doesn't meet your expectations. Maybe it doesn't work like the way the Romans had their empires or the Assyrians or the uh, Babylonians had done their empire building either. Maybe God's reign isn't even really like David and Solomon conquering and raising up armies and invading neighboring kingdoms. Maybe God's reign looks different. Different. And in an important sense, that's why so often in Jesus' teaching, he keeps coming back to describing new and often subversive pictures of what God's reign actually looks like. And at the same time, Jesus is giving an answer to the unspoken question, okay, Jesus, if you're supposed to be the one telling us all about God's kingdom or bringing in, ushering in God's reign, how come it doesn't look like it? How come you don't match our expectations? Because to be fair. Jesus doesn't look like anybody's expectation. He's not a military general commanding armies or raising up the, the people in a militia like the zealots wanted. He's not commanding supernatural angel hosts to zap his enemies or burn them with fire. Jesus comes with the ordinary power of everyday people, welcoming everyday ordinary people and bringing life, but not what anybody expected the kingdom to look like. It had to be as shocking 
as Copernicus saying, the earth is at the center of the solar system, the sun is, and we go around the sun, to hear Jesus say, the reign of God doesn't look like the empires you've seen all your life. So Jesus offers us this coming Sunday, a handful of different snapshots of what the reign of God looks like. And, and at first you might notice they all seem kind of small, at least small in the beginnings, because Jesus' point is to say God's reign doesn't look like the giant parade or show of force that Rome or Babylon uses. God's reign is subtle, subversive, and starts out small and then works its way to the cracks. Well, like this. Jesus says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Just stopping there for a moment, those two images suggest something small that does its work by being small and then growing, working through to become something bigger, and that both a mustard seed that becomes a shrub that even the birds can make their nests in, and the yeast that goes into the dough that becomes the whole batch of, of dough for the bread, both of those are things whose purpose isn't to dominate but to do good for something bigger than themselves, right? The, the mustard seed is this tiny thing that eventually gives itself away. The seed cracks open, becomes a shrub, and the goal of the shrub, Jesus says, it becomes big enough that even the birds of the air can make nests inside its branches. In other words, its purpose isn't just for itself. It eventually becomes something that houses even the birds. And the yeast in the dough, the yeast isn't there for its own sake. The yeast gives itself away, right? It sort of eventually sort of gets baked up, giving off the air bubbles that become the, the softness of the bread for the sake of the whole loaf of bread. The yeast is there not so you taste the yeast. If you're tasting bread and you go, mm, you can really taste the yeast, somebody's made some bad bread. But it gives itself away so that the whole loaf of bread is not only bigger in volume, but becomes what it's meant to to be both of those images of the reign of God aren't the overt, powerful, we're here to dominate and take over kind of images like Rome or Babylon, but rather this sort of subtle presence that makes things more fully themselves, almost like the image Jesus had used earlier in the Sermon on the Mount of being like salt for the earth, right? That salt is there to make other things taste better, to preserve other things. If it's the dominating uh, flavor or it's the only thing there, something's gone wrong but it's there to enhance whatever else it's put in. Jesus envisions his community and the reign of God as this presence that lives right under the surface, that's right there in the midst of ordinary life, that doesn't have to come in marching with its imperial banners unfurled or uh, armies in uh, motion in order to intimidate and dominate people. But God's reign happens in ordinary circumstances right under our nose and can even happen right under the empire's nose so that God's reign could be happening there in the first century even when Rome wasn't aware of it, even when Caesar hadn't given his approval. There's two other images Jesus uses for what the reign of God is like, and he continues with sort of these images of things that are small and unexpected. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. In his joy, he goes all that he sells to have, that he has to go buy that field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. There's this image of like God's reign being this unexpected treasure that maybe nobody else notices, but you discover the value of, and it's worth giving everything to hold on to. God's reign isn't this obvious dominating power that sort of marches in and everybody has to get in line behind, but it's this surprising, unexpected thing, like yeast in the dough or finding a treasure in the field or a pearl that's worth giving everything you have for. In other words, God's reign doesn't show up the way every other kingdom does. It changes our picture of how God's reign works in the world. And it is as dramatic and revolutionary a change as when Copernicus said, hey, you know what, I did the math and the earth isn't the center of the solar system, the sun is. We gotta change our picture. If we hear kingdom of God and think, ah, God is building an empire. It's up, up to us church folk to conquer the world and make everybody fall in line getting the wrong picture. Jesus has come to say, no, what if instead it's about being this small, subtle presence that gives ourselves away for the sake of the world around us?
those are the images Jesus has given us. And wrapping our minds around them is probably going to blow apart our old assumptions about how things work. But Jesus is convinced we can handle it. Jesus is convinced that maybe we can let go of the old backward wrong, two small pictures of how God reign, God's reign works. And instead that we're ready maybe to hear these surprising pictures of God's reign, of the kingdom of heaven happening, not like armies marching into town to conquer, but rather like the subtle presence of yeast in bread dough that makes the whole thing rise, of the small little seed that becomes a shrub big enough for birds to find a home there. Those are the conversations we're going to be looking at this coming Sunday. So join the conversation with us then. See you Sunday.